Welcome to the career sessions with my mate in HR, where Tracy and I talk to everyday people about their career journeys. Um, today, I'm delighted to uh, introduce Martin Lovett, who I've known, I uh, guess, for about four years through mutual friends and through our kids at school, um, who has his own business. Um, but I'll let you talk about that, Martin, if you want to start by telling us about your career journey. Well, thank you for the wonderful intro. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, I, my current business is uh, Magnify Brands. Uh, we operate in the duty-free, uh, global duty-free sector. So we represent about 14 brands across multiple categories, uh, beauty, cosmetics, electronics, jewellery, etc. Um, and we supply these brands. We work, to, work as agents and we supply the brands to airlines, cruise ships uh, and airport duty frees all around the world. Um, uh, probably one of the many sectors which has been sort of quite severely affected over the last uh, 12, 14 months with the COVID crisis. So, uh, you know, during that time, it's been quite interesting because we've had to diversify um, uh, away from our, our core category uh, because there is no business currently. Um, and so we've had to sort of look at sort of a couple of numerous projects which we've been involved with, uh, startups, et cetera, taking on new brands that can take us into sort of new markets. Brilliant. So, uh, yeah. Um, basically, um, my career really started way back at school. Um, you know, well, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I'm dyslexic, so I really did struggle at school uh, with learning. I was fortunate, my family, picked up on it quite early on. I was sort of probably about eight or nine when my parents realised um, there was, you know, a learning difficulty there. But it was an era where dyslexia was thrown around but by teachers in the education sector. But it was a bit of a hot potato because no one really knew about it or, more importantly, it seemed how to address it. So, you know, I sort of moved schools and any, anyway, I ended up at school which sort of nurtured it and really sort of helped me get through the early stages with it, which, uh, which was great. But sort of fast forward through sort of school and edu uh, a college, it really, as you can imagine, wasn't sort of my favourite place to be. Um, purely when you struggle at something and then you're forced to do it every day, it becomes a little bit sort of wearing over time. So by the time I sort of got to sort of leaving school, I was a bit of a, a lost sheep, so to speak. I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I think, Lucy, we've talked about this before where we've had friends, family members, brothers, siblings, um, where they're like at the age of 11, right, I'm going to be this, uh, which Beth is phenomenal. Or, uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, was, I was firmly in your camp, Martin. I, I right, was, okay. I'm going to be an international superstar. I don't quite know what happened. <laughs> really? uh, yeah. Yeah, well, you've still got time. Yeah, um, thank God, this would be it. I mean, these, these, this, this is just the start it. of it. The podcast could thrust you that direction. But, um, but yeah, so I kind of... Um, Sort of when I when I left uh, school, I sort of I just I sort of sat down and thought, well, what do I like doing? I like dealing with people. Um, I like sort of seeing the world. Um, so I kind of went down that sort of leisure tourism sort of path, but uh, at college, but didn't really. I, I, in my heart of hearts, it's still you know as I came out of the sort of three years, I knew it really wasn't what I wanted to do. But again, at that point, still had not that sort of that dart in the dartboard, as you like to say. So. Um, I um, went into the uh, airline industry as cabin crew, believe it or not. Uh, not many people know that. Well, <laughs> depending on how many people watch this, a few extra might know now. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I was cabin crew for British Midland for, uh, for uh, just under a year. Um, just wanted to sort of see the sights and sounds. A lot of friends, partners at the time. Um, were cabin crew uh, air hostesses so um, so it kind of sounded like a glamorous world um, so I did that and uh, during that time I realized that that real sort of customer engagement facing dealing with people pro problem solving I really quite enjoyed but I, I realized I sort of wanted to sort of venture into that sort of sales um, sales arena but you know as as always coming out of one industry to another with no experience um, at the age of probably about 21, you know, it was awful. You know, people just, every job I went for was, where's your experience? Where's your experience? We need experience in sales. Um, and, it, you know, I was banging my head um, against the wall, really. So I um, took a job uh, which was door-to-door -door selling of aerial photography. 
random I know but it was a job that was in the papers we did have papers back then um, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and yeah just sort of uh, you know applied um, and it was it was an awful job in the sense that look, I'm not you know knocking it that anyone that's doing it but it was awful in the sense that you know long days long nights because people didn't get home till late they wanted their husband or partner to um to make the decision and so you were sort of hanging around at sort of nine ten o'clock at night um you know it was and i think i i think that job actually cost me more money than i made so it probably tells you how great a sales i am really but <laughs> so, uh, so uh, did you not yeah. get quite a few pissed off people as well when you're knocking at their doors? Totally. I mean, a literally. Hostility. Yeah. What, yeah, like, I mean, especially, and I, I really found it difficult in, in areas where you have sort of the uh, maturer elderly generation because, you know, it gets to eight o'clock and you're knocking on the door and you know, you know, as you're trained, that last knock could be a sale. Um, you know, then, you know, you, you get this sort of, you know, very sort of wary, scared in some cases person. So you sort of find yourself having to sort of de-escalate the situation. Um, and then sort of before you can, you know, 45 minutes later, they haven't heard a word because they're deaf. But uh, no, but no, you know, it's, it's one of those things. It's, 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 it's just, it was relentless. It was, um, but it was great because this is one of the things that I wanted to highlight, you know, when you sent me some lovely uh, sort of notes through uh, bullet points, you know, where are the challenges in life, where's the challenges in career? And I think that really did set me up um, with all joking aside in the sense that because it was so hard work, because it was just knock after knock, but you had to keep going, you had to sort of wash off a duck's back to coin a phrase. Um, that has really served me uh, in the roles that I've done, that I've done since, and my current position um, within 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 the company that I've, I'm fortunate enough to own. Um, so you know, it, it is it, it was a, at the time I couldn't understand it, but you know, but looking back on it now, it was a good life experience. Yeah. How long did you do that for? Um, probably again another a year. It was about a year because I need I knew I you know everyone I spoke to about getting within I wanted to get into a blue chip organization my father was had quite a successful career in his industry uh in, in sort of uh senior sales marketing sort of vice president level uh he always said Martin you know great advice he's always been a guidance through through my career which has been phenomenal um and you know he said just get try to get blue chip experience because once you've got blue chip experience even if it's in a business you, know, you guys know this but you know in, in a sector that you don't really want to be in it looks phenomenal on your CV um, so that's exactly what I did. I sort of, I, that's the, the route I went and I got into uh, what, what they're called now is Unilever, but they were best foods at the time. Um, and um, I, I managed to fortunately secure a sales representative job there, um, which gave 13 weeks of blue chip uh, training, which was phenomenal. So I stayed with them for just a little over two and a half years. Um, again, not a sector I close to my heart and passionate about but you know all the way along this journey I'm a constant thinker that's one of the things I'm always analyzing not just analyzing life but I'm analyzing myself what is it I do how do I do it how can I do it better um because we can you know I think we can we're all our we're our best best critic aren't we really um and I think we can learn a lot from our mistakes and I don't I know it's a really, really old, old saying. I've, we've heard it from a lot of super successful people over the years, but there is no such thing as failure in my eyes because you know we we learn from what we do. We learn from what we don't get quite right. Um, what is failure? Failure is what our expectations are, our own expectations. We set those expectations, um, and you know if we don't quite meet them, you know. So what, you know, take the positives from it and make sure you don't make those mistakes again. And that's what I sort of tried to do. And then, funny enough, I had a, this exact same chat yesterday, by chance, friend I hadn't spoken to for six months, brilliant friend of mine from, you know, going back 20 years. He's successful in his own right, got his own business. And he was just explaining a bit, bit about, you know, an issue he had recently with his business and he felt that he'd failed. And we talked it through and, you know, by the end of it, you know, we both saw it. He hadn't failed. Systems had let him down. Things had let him down. But, you know, what have you learned from it? And, you know, I think that's a, one of the sort of life lessons that I've sort of taken through all my career, really. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Very good so, advice. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's hard, to, it's hard advice to accept, you know, it's because you've got to kind of, you know, come to terms with it yourself, I think, so at first. So, uh, so yeah, so 
Um, yeah, then my sort of next sort of 10 years was sort of within the watch and jewellery sector. I'm working for um, um, a w- couple of watch brands, working up from sort of sales rep through to their international sales director, looking after global distribution, um, both in uh, domestic markets around the world, as well as travel retail. Um, and then I went to the last sort of employed role I was in, uh, if you like to say, for a, a company uh, was just a startup which was trying to restructure their sales team. Uh, and every time I sort of took a took a, a new opportunity, it, it wasn't all about the pay sometimes. It was actually about the experience that it could give me. I think from a young age, I knew from cycling around my estate at 13 on my bike with my next door neighbour doing car washing, um, that we wanted, I wanted to work for myself. Um, and, you know, when I was 20, I believed I knew it and I could do it. Uh, it never happened, thankfully. In my 30s, I believed I knew it and I could do it. Unfortunately, it didn't happen. Um, and it wasn't until the 40s that I took the step to create Magnify. And I look back and think, thank God I didn't do it any earlier because... You know, really, I, where I thought I knew it, I just genuinely didn't. And, you know, I used that, I say I used, I benefited, should I say, from the, the, the opportunities I was given during my career to round myself. I mean, again, not rounded, but uh, never will be, but, you know, rounded enough to sort of take take that ultimate step of creating my own um, own dream, own, own future, if you like to so. say. Was there a particular thing that triggered you kind of going, now's the time? now this is right for me now yeah look i i think you hear a lot of people that sort of i'm mean, again i've started their own business i don't like to, I, I don't really like i don't like the label entrepreneur because i think entrepreneur i mean richard branson's an entrepreneur right these guys that have done phenomenal you know look at them and they're what they set up their business empires etc that's phenomenal you know um what we've created what i've created um it was it, was, it stars aligned i think for people like myself it really is about stars aligned. It's, about, it's not about one defined moment that made me go, wow, that's, um, that's, that's what made me do it, or that's, that, that's what enabled me to do it. It was a number of things, you know, uh, being very open, uh, the relationship with my last company came to an end. Um, it, the opportunity was to exit the business at the right time. Um, I had numerous people at that time saying to me, look, you know, brands, uh, and a very, very good partner, which is still a very good partner to me today, business partner, not business in the sense of financially, but we, we subcontract to one another in the States. He's been a fantastic mentor. And that's another point, you know, it's, it's really important for me. A bit of advice to my 18 year old self is find a business or a mentor in, within business that can guide you and give you advice that's older, that's been there, that's done it. You know, you don't, some of the stuff you hear, you don't want to hear because you feel like you know it. Um, but you don't effectively um, know it all and you can't. We're humans, you know, we don't know what's going to, tomorrow's going to bring. We're going to learn something new this afternoon, no doubt. So, um, and Lenny, you know, this chap in America gave me some sound advice and, you know, said, look, we can create some opportunities together. I can subcontract you some brands very early on, straight away, in fact. Um, and that was a massive help. You know, look, I'd like to say oh, I was all blood, sweat and tears and I took a huge risk. I mean, to a degree I did. I've got two children at the time. I, I had a mortgage, um, a relatively healthy one. Um, and, you know, it's you, you look at, look around at your family, a wonderful wife, and you look around at your family and you think, well, if I take that step now and I get it wrong, um, it's not about, I don't have, you know, do I have the money to pay the bills? It's that you've eaten through your life savings if you get it wrong. And, you know, what about kids uni? What about this? What about, and, you know, all this plays on your mind. Um, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but for me, I, I do give those kind of things very serious consideration, but I don't overthink it. I think if you overthink something, it's like a bungee jump. Never, I've never done it, so this is probably <laughs> rubbish advice, but I can imagine if you were to do a jump, bungee jump, if you sat at the top of the bridge thinking about it enough, you won't do it. Sometimes you just get up there, look, you know, don't look down and jump and, you know, you, you, you'll, you'll sort it out on the way down kind of thing. And I think that's kind of, you know, the way I sort of I, I sort of approach business still to this day to a degree. It's calculated. I, I know the risks. The risks are calculated, but the risks don't put me off because, you know, without risk, there's no reward. Yeah. So, so, when, so when, when, when did you set up Magnify then? Uh, Magnify Brands was it's nearly five years old, believe it. I mean, I can't believe it. It's just it's just gone phenomenally, um, phenomenally quickly. 2016 in September. So um, 
Yeah, so we started out uh, at the time, uh, as I say, I subcontracted some brands. I didn't have any brands myself, so I subcontracted some brands in. Uh, I knew, obviously, subcontract. I needed my own brands as well, um, because whilst, you know, Lenny's a fantastic guy, you know, you, you can't rely on other people all the time. You need to, you know, source the business yourself. So, but it was it was a, a, a good journey because I think going back to that point that I mentioned, I thought I knew it in my 20s. I thought I knew it in my 30s. You know, what the 40s gave me um, was the fact a good network of people that knew me, knew what I was able to do, um, my abilities. Um, so once the word started to spread, sort of the new product or new brand engagement conversations were quite fast flowing, to be honest, um, you know, for whatever reason uh, f- from their side, but they weren't happy where they were at with who they were dealing with. So, so yeah, so, you know, that, that portfolio went sort of from sort of three, four brands. Uh, I think we're up to about 14, 15 brands now, um, but there is a limit to what we want to do. We're not yeah. brand hoarders. We don't make money by saying, look, these are all the brands we represent. We make money from selling them and we have to be able to make sure that our sales team, um, which are here in the UK, Europe, uh, Middle East and Asia Pacific and the Americas, uh, have the time in their in their days to, 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 to assign to you know, each brand and give the brands the time that they deserve. Um, so, um, so yeah, so it's, uh, so yeah, we, as I say, we've got multiple pro- pro- uh, brand uh, products. So from the, say the jewelry, the, the beauty, uh, f- uh, from, uh, also the Harry Potter jewelry, accessories, etc. We try to find a, a nice collective mix because, you know, I've learned from my career that if you're focused in one product category, it's very high risk because if that sector suffers, like take the, you know, even forget the product category, look at the industries. You know, we, we've learned it ourselves that I've known for years that we're high risk. We deal just with duty-free travel retail. What happens if something happens? Well, you know, look what has happened, you know. Um, yeah. And I kind of, I think, I know we're jumping around a bit, but I think, you know, back when this did happen, um, you know, I was very naive. I thought, right, three months we'll be back to business you know we've seen this before it's uh you know SARS etc there's it's a it's an outbreak it'll be contained three four months we'll you know be fine um after the sort of the third month um I was thinking perhaps uh we need to be looking at something else and I, I'd known in the back of my head that I needed to be looking for something a diversification um just didn't have the time to be honest it was my own fault again uh, a little self-criticism um, I should have applied more time to it prior uh, to 219, um, but it didn't happen. So we don't look back, we look forward. And I spent pretty much 2020 uh, looking at new op- opportunities. Uh, and believe it or not, I took on four new brands for travel retail, uh, knowing that there's a risk we may lose brands. So we need to bolster the portfolio, but also knowing that brands are now suffering domestically. So when this does we do come out the other end, it's not going to be sort of pull the trigger and we're off. It's going to be a very slow, you know, steady pace up to up to running speed. So yeah. these brands are going to want to be looking for new markets. They're going to need new sources of revenue. Um, and if they're not in travel retail, once travel retail kicks back in, they'll get it. Um, so uh, that's the approach we took. And as I say, we signed the new brands there. And then we, I got involved in a couple of startup projects trying to bring new brands to market good friend of mine in the US created a fantastic concept called Protect Aid, which was contained sort of all your essential uh, products for COVID. So hand sanitizer, gloves, masks, et cetera, et cetera, in a, in a handy travel kit. That you, the design was to put in your glove box, handbag, et cetera. Um, but unfortunately, um, you, know, we fe- you know, we were hoping markets would open up. So there'd be a demand, but markets didn't really open up. So that travel accessory, nece- you know, wasn't necess- necessarily required by the average consumer. Mm-hmm. So then we just um, had a couple of other projects as well, uh, Ozonation, etc., which clean rooms, and that's a long-term project we're still working on. But the, uh, fast forwarding to the sort of now, here and now, we've created a new company. Um, so we've got Magnify Brands. We've created, or I've created Magnify Distribution with a very good uh, friend, Lucy York. Tony, Tony okay. Wild. Uh, Tony and I, um, Tony has a very successful recruitment business, uh, in the le- but unfortunately it's in the leisure and hospitality sector, which again, um, as we all know, has been massively hit. So we got our heads together and I said, look, I think I've got a product. 
I think you've got a, a fantastic route to market uh, from B2B um, with these masks. These masks are transparent masks. Um, so unlike the full face coverings, they're uh, highly transparent, uh, highly breathable, very safe indeed. Um, and uh, great for customer facing roles with customers wanting to um, improve customer service. But more importantly, um, it actually, and it, this is sort of a, a sensitive top, topic for many people out there, uh, it actually uh, addresses the issue about the forgotten demographic. And what I mean by that is the people that are deaf, hard of hearing, learning disabilities, autism, um, all the other um, unfortunate conditions people that I haven't mentioned can people deal with every day that have suffered in silence because they either their condition doesn't allow them to wear a full face covering mask, anxiety attacks or whatever, um, or, or hard of hearing or being deaf, um, um, or um, uh, just don't feel comfortable wearing them. So, you know, we, we partnered with a Spanish company, the masks are made in Spain. We didn't want to source from China because all the sort of connotations um, that surround that. So we sort of um, partnered with these guys um, we've just signed, which is quite exciting for us, we think it's a big step, and we're very proud of, we've just signed with MenCap, um, so the charity, the largest le learning difficulty charity in the UK, uh, we're going to be donating, we've guaranteed £10,000 minimum donation for year one, uh, but we are also giving um, a percentage of sales of every product we sell here in the UK to their good cause. Um, and we wanted to do something, it wasn't, you know, we want... We felt that we had a real, we do feel we've got a fantastic product um, and it's only six weeks old. Um, so, you know, hopefully you'll see more and more of this as we start sort of engaging with our conversation with the high, large high street retailers. Um, but we've had a huge engagement from B2B. We've supplied over 300 schools uh, throughout the UK for their teaching staff, because not only they, <clears throat> excuse me, do they offer fantastic protection, um, it, it, it helps the children. I mean, I, Florence, my, my youngest, she's nine. Um, she, she, we're very fortunate. She has no learning difficulties or anything as such, but she doesn't like masks. She, she's, you know, especially at the beginning, she was very scared and very aware when people were wearing masks. And mm -hmm. I think it's just a barrier that's unnecessary. I mean, it's necessary, don't get me wrong, to keep people safe. But I think there's better ways of keeping people safe, but then trying to remove some of that barrier for, for the... I saw, I, I've seen the product, Martin, and it's it's brilliant. And I, I've often thought about it because I, I was just in the supermarket last week and there was this lady who was clearly hard of hearing mm. at the checkout. And the lady on the checkout had a mask, so you wasn't see, transparent, so you couldn't see. Mm. And I could tell this lady was getting really upset because she couldn't understand what she was saying. She couldn't hear. And you just think, yeah, it, it it's a it's such a good idea. Such You're absolutely idea. right. And I mean, that, you know, and you see and hear this all the time. And it's it's so frustrating. And what's most frustrating for us is that the fact that the governments uh, keep every every couple of, I think it's every month or so, they, they, they redo the, their advice on certain elements of COVID and, and masks is one of them. And yeah. we get updates as a result of our relationships with MenCap, etc. on this. And it's so frustrating because the government's advice is around uh, transparent masks um, is, you know, uh, it's not the top of the priority because every, and, and they even say it, every mask we've tested um, doesn't deliver the protection levels. And we, we do, our products have been independently tested. There is a law, EU law that you have to make masks too. There's a standardization. A lot of the masks you see in shops probably don't conform to this EU standard, but general sure public- Poundland ones probably don't. <laughs> well, yes, I'm, I'm not passing comments. Some of them are literally uh, like uh, socks, aren't they? <laughs> but this is, it is, and this is the ridiculous thing. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's it. I could spend an hour on this topic because it just frustrates me because yeah. what frustrates me in life is when you've got a solution, but the other party are just not willing to listen. And we've made, I mean, I just emailed Jeremy Hunt again to engage with how do we get in contact with the Department of Health and social care, education, because we've got 300 schools buying this, everyone's raving about it, people are buying it on Etsy, people are buying it on tuna.co.uk. Um, and uh, <laughs> and um, smooth, I didn't even notice that. Don't know, and, 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 and the, the feedback time after time is like, where have these masks been? I, we've had this lady, it's, it's sort of skin tingling, and it really is. This lady wrote to us and she said, look, my mother's got dementia, she got dementia during COVID. Um, she, she understands who I am when I go to see her, but she doesn't, she keeps forgetting 
about COVID. So every time I turn up with a mask, she gets flustered. She gets very irritated and frustrated with me. Why are you covering your face? You're my daughter. Yeah. And she's tried all these different types of clear face masks, which are you might as well seriously not even waste your money on because they are next to nothing useless. And so she came across our mask. She bought one. She ended up buying several others. And she wrote this glowing review saying that, you know, it, it, like it brought a tear to her eye that the next day she went to see her mum. Her mum broke down because she could finally see her smile. And, yeah. you know, this is why we do it. These are, the, these are the stories, why we're so passionate about it. Those children, those adults with all those disabilities that just people overlook because I'm all right, Jack, you know, mentality. And it's, it's, it has to stop. And in fact, there's an Equality Act, but a government law, uh, where all UK companies, as you probably know, in your roles have to make um, uh, um, provisions um, for people with learning disabilities or other disabilities. Now that could be going to a hotel and having a disabled lift, to having a disabled toilet in a restaurant, to having a ramp outside a shop. But what it also does mean in modern day terms um, is the fact that if you're wearing full face covering masks, you cannot communicate to that sector. And if you cannot communicate to that sector, you're in breach of the law. And it's as simple as that. Um, and, you know, we, we are trying to sort of educate businesses in the UK on that um, to help them improve their standards and, 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 and customer service as well. And more importantly, help the, those with disabilities. Yeah, brilliant. So you you so, mentioned the last year has been, has been quite challenging for you. What, what would hmm. you say the most challenging time in your career has been? My, I would say the, the most is the start, you know, actually getting my career going. That was, you know, yeah. super challenging because bearing in mind, I mean, Lucy, you may have been in a similar situation, but, or may not, but, you know, you're 21, you're trying to find yourself, uh, all your friends are off, they're at uni, they're doing their courses and it's booming and, you know, you've got other friends that didn't go to uni, they've got jobs and they're, they're in it and they're, they're, they're succeeding and they're earning money and I'm, you know, you're at home, not earning money living off the bank of mum and dad, it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's demoralizing, it's frustrating. Um, and for someone like, I'm, I'm quite an energetic individual. Uh, I don't sort of sit still a lot. And no, you know, I, I, I think a lot and it, then <laughs> thinking frustrates. So yeah, I'd say that was probably um, one of the most challenging times. And I'd say the last 12 months is, is pretty much up there, to be honest, you know, you've got, again, without sounding, um, I'm insensitive. I was fortunate that, you know, the first three, four years of Bankify were good to me. You know, um, I worked hard. Um, my team worked hard and we established our brands and we we benefited from that success. Um, and then to have it taken away, um, it's tough. It's tough. But, you know, you sit there and you can go, you can sit there and poor old me. And, you know, yes, I do do that to a degree with my wife. You know, I sort of think, oh, why, why? But you, you, you can't help but think that. But the reality is it's happening to, to many, 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 many people. Um, you know, three or four friends of mine, similar boat, they've got their own businesses, exactly. So, so it's not a personal attack. It just is what it is. Um, and you can either sit there and, and wallow in self-pity or you can, you know, actually try to do something about it. And you're the only person that can make change. So you have to yeah. get on and try new things. So on the flip side of that, what would you say has been your kind of career defining moment or its kind of highlight? Um, believe it or not, uh, well, two really, there's starting Magnify because it was a very, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> a very um, big step. You know, like I said to you earlier, when you're in your forties with a family and, you know, finan you know, financial commitments over you to take that step was a big step and, and I had to have the support of my, of my wife Alison as well with that um, and, and I'd also say excuse me the last probably six to 12 weeks taking on this new brand because you know I've learned a lot I've learned a lot you know I, we've set up a new business from scratch we've set up which is something I've done fair enough we you know I've never acted as just as a distributor we've always been agents so we we never take responsibility of stock we just act as a sales arm for our brand so you know I'm having to fund this so Tony and I are having to fund this so it's you know again it's another recommitment um, at a very difficult challenging time where the other business you know the the, the income there is is a lot less than where it was um, so you know I think these two 
these two sort of pivotal times for me are sort of standout moments, to be honest. Yeah. And you, if you kind of could call your 18 year old self, we, we've talked about some of the learnings you've had, what would be the one thing you'd want your 18 year old self to know? You can do it. I mean, back then at 18, I, you know, you, again, not dwelling on the dyslexia element, but, you know, you go through school at a time where, I uh, get the violins out now, um, but, you know, you go through school and it was a time where, again, it wasn't that well known. Um, I remember one interview, uh, I was told, uh, one of the, se- I got to the second round interview, and one of the senior people of this particular company said, uh, you know, it was, I, I, it came up, I was dyslexic. And he said, well, what, what disease is that? <laughs> you know, and and I was like, I, I, things like that don't bother me. I mean, oh you know, I, 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 you can't be offended by someone else's, I wouldn't even say ignorance, I would just say just lack of knowledge. You know, he was a lovely guy and a very nice guy with it, but he just didn't know how to word it, he didn't know what it was. Um, and I think that you did get a lot of that through school, you're in the bottom set, you know, you, you know, I'd read things and I'm thinking, I can't understand why I can't learn for a test because I, I you know my mum would come and go you haven't revised I'm like mum I've looked at this bit of paper models will be blank you know what I mean because <laughs> tomorrow I'll go in and I remember one of my teachers said well the good thing about you know with your condition is you get more time in the test I said I don't need test at time I need answers I mean I did you know it wasn't I could have sat there for days but I wouldn't have got a better grade um you know unless you're grading me on how well I sit um, but you know, it's it's that, and that I went through that all my life, uh, and, and and not I. Sorry, I should rephrase that. People in my position probably went, uh, did go through that because I've got a couple of other friends with with who are dyslexic, uh, and you know they unfortunately didn't get it picked up early enough, and that, so it's a bit more um, prominent in their in, in in their current lives. Um, but yeah, I think you know getting to eighteen, and and you know you've got this, you know you've had a bit of the stuffing knocked out knocked out of you. Uh, through the education process so you know you know you do start questioning your worth or what you're able to do and where you're what kind of career are you going to have and I think the the answer to that is you can have any career you want you'll have to work for it and I had to I took on roles I took promotions without pay rises over the years I took promotions in departments which probably wouldn't be the direction I wanted to go in at the time but it was a promotion I did things up didn't benefit me for there and now, but I did it for the you know, for the long term success of what I could potentially be, um, and I think that's that's sort of the advice I'd probably give myself. I am um, I'm also dyslexic, so I hear everything <laughs> you're saying, um, including the classic time I heard my father. I think I mentioned it in the podcast. He went, "Oh, the Tracy School's very good," and, and I actually wasn't um, I wasn't diagnosed until I was twenty. Oh, wow. Crumbs, that is old, isn't it? Yeah, so I went through the whole thing. I was actually training to be a lawyer. And uh, some, oh. one, of the prin- one of the training principals was an ex-teacher who picked up. Oh, really? And, yeah. And he's like, I'm like, yeah. And uh, my dad, uh, to, to put it, uh, said to somebody, one day, this must be a very good school, because when Tracy started, I thought she'd be lucky to get a job in Sainsbury. Um, um, but ju- just because the school had always told my parents I was a bit slow, I wasn't that bright. And... Um, that had been a theme. And I think it's, to your point, it's very easy to let that go you down. Now, luckily I was almost a bit blase about it. I was like, well, if I'm dumb, I might as well have some fun and just do the best I can. Um, and, and surprisingly, that got me a lot further than perhaps it should. <laughs> 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 um, but uh, yeah, it's really, I completely hear you. The education system, if you're not, if you don't fit the mold, it can be very harsh and it can be very difficult and it can have long-term effects on your confidence and your, belief that you can do things because you spend quite a lot of time in public going oh yeah but you know she, she I used to get a lot she contributes and that's nice yeah <laughs> I got that as well yeah yeah brilliant brilliant contribution gets you everywhere um. <laughs> thank, thank goodness though that uh, you know awareness is is changing on yeah. dyslexia yeah. I think kids are being picked up so much earlier now and yeah, there's so yeah. much more help available. And I think everybody knows that it's not a measure of how intelligent you are, it's just how you learn. I was mainly um, gutted at 20 because I'd missed out on the chance for a free laptop. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you get diagnosed early enough, you get a laptop. I mean, yeah. exactly. Oh god, if only. Oh. But no, I agree with that. I think it is. It is. It is one of those things. It's the sooner you pick up on it, you change. They change your learning habits. Um, yes. You know. Yeah, totally. I. I, I yeah. I, I, and like many other conditions out there, it's you know it, the world is a is a better place now, and it yeah. continues to be. Yeah. And tell us, what, what are your plans for the future then, Martin, and for Magnify? Well, look, I mean, it's a, it's a good question in this current climate, you know, um, because, you know, I have some ideas, but, you know, it's all governed on um, markets coming back and what condition are the markets going to be and what are the big, you know, what are the, the companies that we supply, the airlines we supply, are they all going to be there? Are our brand partners going to be there? So it's, 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 it's a very challenging, good question, but very challenging one. Yeah. Um, look, my, my goal is to to absolutely reestablish, um, you know, the business that we had in, in the tri global travel retail sector. I love that industry. The people that operate within it are phenomenal. Um, and, you know, even the competition, you know, the competitors, when we go to trade shows, there's, you know, we're out for dinner with them. It's just great. It's a lovely environment. So I, 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 I and I love the brands that we represent and I want to continue that route. And that's definitely going to be a, a core driving uh, focus for me. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think, look, you know, I think with with the masks, it's the magnified distributions, if I'm honest, it's not distribution isn't something we really want to get heavily involved in, um, in terms of um, outside of the masks, because uh, it will distract us from our core travel retail sector. Um, but look, you know what, I'm open to everything. If the, one thing, again, another thing, one thing, another thing that's, that I've learned in 12 months is, do you think your core business is this? It's now this and this. Uh, and, you know, if, if an opportunity comes along, that you know, I can add value. And it's all about, to me, it's about business partnerships are about, I look at other people saying, what value do they bring to me? But more importantly, what do I bring to them? And if, you know, if there's a business opportunity in the future where I have a skill set or, or, or knowledge experience that can help bring something or something out, out of our core sector to market, I'll, I'll explore it. Everything's, everything's open. Brilliant. Tracy, have you got any more questions? I, I think only one thing, if you had one tip to give our audience, so whoever, whatever age they are, whatever time of life it is, one top tip you'd give that you, that from your career that you think everyone should have. I would say, um, and it has to be because it's so uh, here, it's a so here now topic for me. It's, it's that failure topic. There is no such thing as failure. Please don't think oh, I won't do something because I'm worried I'm going to fail or I failed at this before and I'm not going to prepare to do it because failure is in your own mind and you can control that and you don't fail, you learn. Brilliant. Amazing. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you so much um, for coming on our uh, podcast today, Martin. It's been thank an Thank you, ladies. Pleasure. It's been brilliant. Yeah.